All right. Hello and welcome to uh, the first quarterly web convening for the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign um, being hosted today by the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, and this quarter, we are focusing on challenging criminalization of homelessness through litigation and uh, with the launch of our new legal advocacy manual. Uh, I'm Eric Tars, uh, a senior attorney here at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, uh, together with Tristia Bauman, our other senior attorney, and we'll have several speakers uh, further on in the presentation today. For those of you not familiar with the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign, we are a national and translocal campaign launched last November together with the National Coalition for the Homeless and more than 100 national, regional, state, and local partners. Uh, we have close to 500 endorsements now, um, including ones from high profile folks such as Eric Holder, the former attorney general, uh, and several mayors, city councilors, um, county supervisors. Uh, so we are a growing campaign and we encourage everybody to get involved um, no matter where you are. Uh, for those who are looking for more information on the campaign, you can check out our website, uh, endorse the campaign, um, and join our mailing list to get uh, our updates, to get um, calls to action from different group members, uh, to be able to post strategy questions and talk with uh, people doing this work all across the country, whether you are a litigator or a policy advocate or an organizer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully we can get everybody muted and not uh, not get feedback. Um, so um, so check us out at housing.handcuffs.org, and we will um, uh, and we welcome you to uh, encourage others in your community to join the campaign as well. Uh, and we know that this issue is urgent because right now. Rather than housing homeless people, many communities are putting them in handcuffs and jailing them at a rate 11 times that of the general population, often because their only crime is that of trying to survive while on the streets. Uh, and this pattern disparately affects communities of color, LGBTQ populations, persons with disabilities, and other marginalized groups. And <clears throat> this uh, these intersections and conversations about them will be part of our discussion at our annual national forum on the human right to housing coming up in June in Washington, D.C. on uh, June 6th to 7th. Um, there we'll be discussing these issues of intersectionality along with uh, the new challenges that we're facing with the current administration and Congress. So we hope you will save the date and we will be sending out registration information as soon as it becomes possible, available. Um, so just a quick note about uh, today's webinar. Right now, uh, all the participants are in listen-only mode, uh, but uh, you can type questions throughout the presentation um, into the little box on the sidebar highlighted in this red box here. and. Uh, when the time comes at the end to share updates or ask questions, you can also raise your hand virtually by clicking on uh, this icon circled here, uh, and that'll note uh, that you want to ask a question, and then we, w we can call on you and unmute your line, and you'll be able to ask it. Um, and just as a note, today's presentation is being recorded, um, and it might be posted online, so uh, please, uh, you know, if you have any concerns about that, um, you know, you can uh, choose how to how you want, want to participate. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Tricia Bauman, our other senior attorney, to uh, discuss our new report, Housing Not Handcuffs, a litigation manual. Tricia? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> 
Uh, to begin, and I know that most of you are familiar with the crisis of homelessness, but I do want to provide some uh, broad context for our discussion today. We know that homelessness is a national crisis and it's a growing but solvable problem. Uh, and the solvability is what the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign uh, aims to address. Quickly, looking at numbers, in 2016, the HUD point in time count found over 500,000 people living, uh, experiencing homelessness in that year. 32% of those are unsheltered, meaning that they are living on streets, abandoned buildings, in cars, or other places not meant for human habitation. That is one indication of the size of homelessness. Another indication is the count of homeless children enrolled in U.S. schools. And currently, at least 1.36 million homeless children are enrolled in U.S. public schools, which represents a 70% increase since the inception of the foreclosure crisis in 2007. It's also estimated that approximately 7 million people are living doubled up, meaning that they are sleeping on the couches or on the floors or in the extra bedrooms temporarily with friends and families. And again, this represents a significant increase since the inception of the foreclosure crisis in 2007. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> now, despite the large numbers of people who do not have access to housing, uh, an increasing number of cities have chosen to criminally or civilly punish life-sustaining conduct of people when performed in public space. Now, one thing for us to all note is that emergency shelter is not a solution to homelessness, but it can be an important temporary resource, but even that resource is overwhelmed in cities across the country are turning individuals and families away each night, leaving individuals and families with no option but to sleep outdoors and in public space. Despite this, we have seen a marked and dramatic rise in laws that treat activities like sleeping, using blankets or tarps or tents to protect oneself from the elements, sitting, lying down, standing still, speaking if that uh, speech is to request an immediate donation of food or cash, uh, or even accepting food when performed in public space uh, can result in a, an expensive ticket or even jail time in an increasing number of cities across the country. Next slide, please. The Housing Not Handcuffs report, which the Law Center released in November of 2016, tracked the rise of uh, laws criminalizing uh, or civilly punishing homelessness since 2016. So that tracks, again, the time period since the inception of the foreclosure crisis. Those 180 city, city I'm sorry, 187 cities that we have surveyed uh, since 2006 represent both urban and rural communities. They span the nation. And this report provides the only national data on criminalization of homelessness. And we show uh, that there has been a dramatic rise, as I said, in laws that punish all of the basic human activities that every human being must perform in order to survive and which are unquestionably legal when performed in indoor spaces. Uh, and that I'm guessing all of us are performing right as I speak, um, but are uh, punished as crimes when performed outdoors. Next slide, please. So the Housing Not Handcuffs, I'm sorry, can, thank you. The Housing Not Handcuffs a litigation manual is a companion piece to our Housing Not Handcuffs report. In the report, we describe the growing problem. We also describe some constructive policy alternatives. This manual is uh, designed to help litigators and others who are interested in pursuing litigation in their communities to use the power of the courts as a tool to combat criminalization of homelessness.
The manual includes a number of resources uh, that can be helpful to uh, lawyers and other legal advocates. It provides an overview of legal theories, which I'll be quickly going through, uh, considerations for bringing litigation, including how to conduct factual research, public records requests, what to request and whom to request it from, how to work with plaintiffs and some considerations uh, that are unique to working with homeless plaintiffs, how to identify appropriate defendants, and also uh, considerations related to bringing litigation itself, including drafting the complaint, discovery, and perhaps most helpfully, this uh, litigation manual includes case summaries of every case that the law center has in prior litigation manuals. Uh, so this will include uh, cases dating back to really the inception of litigation surrounding criminalization of homelessness broken down by prohibited conduct category and jurisdiction. And just a reminder, uh, if everyone can please mute their line, everyone will be able to hear a lot better. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So what we have found uh, since our last manual, which was released in 2014, is that in the prior few years, there has been a significant amount of litigation activity, uh, particularly surrounding three categories. Uh, one is challenging camping and sleeping restrictions. Another is challenging evictions of homeless encampments or seizure of homeless persons property and also uh, lawsuits challenging panhandling bans. And what we have found is that lawsuits that have uh, been launched in the past three years have resulted largely in positive outcomes. In fact, um, the vast majority of cases in the these three categories have resulted in some positive outcome for plaintiffs uh, for plaintiffs what are those positive outcomes it can include uh, positive orders it can include um, positive settlement agreements whereby expanded protections are available to homeless persons or policies are amended or it may also include a, a court finding that the plaintiffs have raised a, a viable claim and uh, permitting that claim to proceed despite the defendant's uh, uh, motion to have the claim dismissed upon summary judgment. So you can see 57% of cases challenging camping or sleeping restrictions have resulted in positive outcomes, 75% as it relates to evictions of homeless encampments, and 100% of the cases that the Law Center has found challenging panhandling bans uh, have been successful. And you'll hear more about that from our partners at Shepherd Mullen, uh, who worked on this uh, manual update and we're very grateful to have them co-presenting with us today. Next slide, please. So as I said, you're going to hear in more detail about some of the recent litigation activity, but the uh, manual does provide an overview of uh, claims that have been used to challenge different types of criminalization laws. So laws uh, that prohibit camping and sleeping are very common. There, at least 50% of cities nationwide are estimated to prohibit camping, at least in some public places. 27% of cities prohibit sleeping in at least some public places. This includes bans on that activity anywhere in a given community, um, in, in effect, creating a no homeless zone. And in those communities where homeless people have no alternative location to perform life-sustaining conduct, uh, advocates have been successful in raising Eighth Amendment challenges to enforcement of the camping and sleeping bans. Uh, and that is because enforcement of a camping and sleeping ban when sleeping is an unavoidable human activity and must be performed somewhere uh, can be uh, found by a court to be cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. I'll, I'll talk really briefly about conduct versus status. The law is well settled that it is a violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment to punish one's status. 
status. Uh, and many of the cases that have applied an Eighth Amendment analysis in the criminalization context have looked at when a city is punishing conduct that is derivative of status such that punishing the conduct is tantamount to punishing status. Uh, so what that might mean uh, in terms of a factual analysis conducted by the court is looking at whether or not the number of homeless people outnumber the available shelter spaces in a given community. Looking at whether or not the uh, law that's being challenged permits sleeping activity any on any public property um, at all, uh, or if it bans the activity outright throughout the entire city. Um, so those are those are some of the types of factual considerations that a court will use to uh, find that punishing conduct amounts to an unlawful punishment of status. One thing I'll note about the Eighth Amendment um, <clears throat> is that in order to establish standing, there is um, some disagreement among the uh, federal courts about what level of invocation of the criminal system needs to occur before a uh, before a defendant has standing um, to challenge an, uh, an arrest uh, under the Eighth Amendment. And uh, in some courts, they have found that a conviction is necessary before someone can challenge uh, their the punishment of sleeping or camping activity. Other courts have found that um, arrest or other invocation of the criminal justice system is sufficient to establish standing. So it's important to um, determine that before raising an Eighth Amendment claim. Uh, and also, as I said, this is something that can um, be used by defendants to challenge their criminal charges, and that has been used successfully most recently in Washington State. And it also can, uh, of course, serve as the basis for affirmative civil litigation. Next slide, please. Challenging sitting and lying bans. Uh, Again, this is just one type of challenge. These laws are subject to a number of different challenges, but uh, we know that sitting and lying bans are common and they have been challenged most frequently uh, <clears throat> using uh, a, an argument related to the fundamental right to travel. Uh, the right to travel um, is deemed fundamental and therefore any infringement upon that um, is subject to strict scrutiny, meaning any infringement must be narrowly tailored and serve a compelling governmental interest. The U.S. Supreme Court has found that interstate travel uh, is a fundamental constitutional right uh, and they have not ruled that intrastate travel is not a protected fundamental right. Um, and again, there is a uh, difference in the circuits uh, 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 in terms of whether or not an intrastate right to travel, uh, meaning travel within a state, um, is has been found to be a constitutionally protected fundamental right that's rooted in a, a number of different places in the Constitution. Um, some of the courts that have found a right to intrastate travel have tied that to the uh, freedom of movement. And we'll talk a little bit more about freedom of movement in the human rights context in just a moment. Next slide, please. Challenging panhandling bans. So panhandling bans are very common. 61% of cities prohibit panhandling in at least some public places. Uh, these laws have been, uh, especially recently, successfully challenged under the First Amendment speech protections. Panhandling is protected speech uh, pursuant to recent Supreme Court precedent in Reed v. Town of Gilbert. Uh, any regulation that treats panhandling speech different than other types of speech is a content-based restriction on speech um, and therefore is subject to strict scrutiny um, and must meet the uh, compelling governmental standard and narrow tailoring requirement that we just talked about. 
And in addition to outright bans on speech, I also just want to note that there has uh, been a line of cases that have challenged licensing schemes whereby one may panhandle but first has to obtain a license uh, or or do perform some other activity in order to conduct that protected speech. Um, those have been uh, challenged as being uh, unlawful prior restraints on protected speech. Next slide, please. Challenging loitering, loafing, and vagrancy laws. Uh, these laws are very common. Uh, they are really kind of the current uh, version of the ugly laws, the anti oki laws, um, the Jim Crow laws, historical laws of exclusion. 32% of cities uh, prohibit this activity. Loitering laws, and this is something reported about in the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign, are often very vague. For example, they may be written to prohibit sauntering or simply remaining idle in one location. Um, and that level of vagueness uh, can run, run afoul of the 14th Amendment's uh, due process protections. When a law is unconstitutionally vague, it fails to give a person of ordinary intelligence fair notice that their conduct is unlawful, and it also can allow or even encourage arbitrary enforcement. In order to be constitutional, laws have to have at least minimal guidelines on their face to govern law enforcement so that individual officers are not making moment to moment judgments about when a law has been violated. Uh, and particularly for loitering, there is uh, some good Supreme Court precedent in a couple of different um, well, there's good Supreme Court precedent and good federal court precedent uh, that looks at loitering for innocent purposes. And I've quoted here, uh, City of Chicago v. Morales, freedom to loiter for innocent purposes is part of the liberty protected by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And so loitering, loafing, and vagrancy laws um, may <clears throat> be vulnerable to uh, vagueness challenges, among other challenges. Next slide, please. Evictions of homeless encampments have uh, become increasingly common, or at least it appears that way, uh, given reports from the ground um, and also media reports. These evictions are often referred to as sweeps. Sometimes they are conducted pursuant to a particular criminalization ordinance, like a camping ban. Sometimes uh, a government just cites its public health and safety uh, duties as being uh, the lawful basis for conducting a sweep. Evictions of homeless encampments, unlike many of the other criminalization ordinances, involve more than just police and in fact sometimes uh, involve primarily public works, uh, public parks, uh, Department of Transportation, sanitation workers, and other governmental actors. So that's something to um, be mindful of when looking to litigate against uh, eviction of a homeless encampment. There has been a lot of activity surrounding, litigation activity surrounding uh, these evictions in recent years. And much of the success has been on fourth and 14th amendment grounds. Not uh, uncommonly, an eviction of a homeless encampment will occur um, with little or no notice, and it will result in the seizure and destruction of homeless persons' property. Now, for Fourth Amendment purposes, um, I just want to make a note that the possessory interest in property is applicable even when someone is on public property and has no uh, privacy interest in uh, their property being searched, for example. Uh, they still have a possessory interest um, that would prohibit government from uh, seizing and destroying that property without due process. Uh, and of course, the uh, 14th Amendment challenges have been successful largely as it relates to lack of advance notice before seizure of property, uh, and also lack of any process to challenge the seizure of the property post deprivation. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, constitutional theories, the 
manual includes several uh, human rights theories that can be raised. So ratified treaties, uh, human rights treaties, have the same binding force as federal law, and several courts have looked to uh, the guarantees in human rights treaties to help inform the rights that are available under domestic law. And that can apply in the cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, which is the international law equivalent of the cruel and unusual punishment clause. Uh, it applies in freedom of movement, um, which is similar to the right to travel um, protections, equal protection, freedom from discrimination, and also uh, freedom from forced evictions. And we cite to a number of documents that uh, domestic practitioners may not be familiar with, including manuals um, that can be helpful for uh, determining how best to use human rights theories in uh, your domestic litigation. Next slide, please. So that was a very brief overview of some of the claims that have been used to challenge criminalization laws. Uh, and before we get into a more detailed analysis of recent litigation by our friends at Shepard Mullen, I just wanted to highlight that the law, uh, litigation manual does have considerations for bringing litigation. We talked about some of them. Uh, but I do want to uh, just note quickly uh, that when working with homeless plaintiffs, it's important to recognize that the instability that's inherent in homelessness can make it very difficult to maintain contact with plaintiffs. So any uh, litigator who's interested in bringing a case on behalf of homeless individuals should account for and prepare for that. Also, homelessness uh, is often a uh, temporary condition. So one thing, again, to keep in mind is that an individual plaintiff who may have standing to bring a claim this year um, may become housed, may move out of the city in order to become housed, uh, or may otherwise no longer uh, be experiencing homelessness. And uh, that can create problems um, with uh, standing and or mootness during the course of litigation. Uh, so we have some recommendations both um, related to how to choose proper individual plaintiffs, the benefit of uh, trying to seek multiple individual plaintiffs when filing a case, uh, and also uh, considerations related to uh, attempting to certify a class of plaintiffs or seeking an organizational plaintiff in addition to individual plaintiffs to help avoid some of the standing and mootness problems that can arise during the course of protracted civil litigation. And with that, I will turn it over to our friends at Shepard Mullen, Daniel Brown and David Pale, who have uh, helped us very generously on a number of issues uh, and projects for the Law Center and worked most recently on updating our litigation manual. Great. Okay, uh, this is Dan Brown and thank you so much. Um, we are, we're we at Shepherd Mullen are really proud of our work with the Law Center, um, which, as you all know, is really doing such important work for an extremely vulnerable and overlooked population. Um, the manual, which was just summarized um, really well, um, is such a valuable tool, um, you know, for for anyone who wants to be an advocate, um, who needs help being an advocate. I, I really think it's it's a model for. Uh, other civil rights groups, and it, it's just a, a really useful tool, and, and we really are proud to have been able to work on, on just a part of it. Um, obviously, it's it's a lot of work, so we're we're proud to be affiliated with um, the organization. So, so as as you heard, the homeless population is one that is um, increasing, and and quite surprisingly, probably to to many people under under the uh, on the phone. It's becoming increasingly under attack by our, our communities and most worrisomely by, by law enforcement. Um, and again, the guide is a useful tool um, in this age of increased issues arising for the homeless. So my colleague David and I are going to discuss just some of the many cases that 
illustrate the importance of the mission of the law center, namely the criminal, criminalization of the homeless. Um, the fact that there are so many cases, you know, it indicates the seriousness and importance of the issue. Um, but as was also mentioned, there are so many cases that probably should be brought, but are not brought for a variety of reasons, um, particularly relating to the, the, uh, this population. Um, there are issues where um, people have lost cases because of standing, because of the issue of losing contact with, with their clients. So um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. And as you heard, the criminalization of homeless appears in a number of ways increasingly. Um, David and I will be discussing some cases in these areas. Um, those cases which appear again and again challenging law enforcement activities that target or directly or indirectly severely impact the homeless. Um, these areas are, with respect to laws prohibiting camping, which includes sweeps of areas to remove the homeless, and particularly the removal of their property without any notice, without any due process, many times without any ability to, to retrieve their property. And of course, when we're dealing with the homeless, the property that's seized from them is, is sometimes all they have, of course, largely sentimental items as well, and in the areas of laws uh, targeting panhandling. Um, I'll also note we won't be discussing today, but it is in the manual. There was also some um, recent cases targeting food sharing programs and efforts, um, cases regarding access to voting by the homeless. And um, one other item that we're also seeing increasingly are, are uh, people, people using the Americans with Disabilities Act um, as a theory to help um, advance this cause, and, and not just to advance the cause, but to combat the issue of shelters not being accessible to disabled homeless, uh, a very important issue that we're seeing more and more of. So I'm going to discuss some of the recent cases regor regarding the laws targeting camping and, and sweeps, and my colleague will discuss developments in the panhandling cases. So the most common legal theories, as you heard, employed to combat the criminalization of homelessness in these areas. Um, the first one is the Eighth Amendment, the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And as you've heard, it, it, seems, it, seems, it has finally seen some success in cases where law enforcement targets encampments or conducts sweeps to remove homeless people from sidewalks, parks, or other places. Um, what we have seen is a, a, an important and successful legal theory um, regarding the Eighth Amendment has been when there has been a sweep or, or a law passed to prevent camping in what before may have been a very popular you know, camping place for the homeless, but the town or the county that, that brings the or passes these new laws or seeks to enforce them do not have available shelter space. So um, in, those, in those cases, the courts have found that there's a compelling argument under the Eighth Amendment that to criminalize, criminalize sleeping or really living in the only place that you can um, because there's no shelter space um, is a potent legal theory that, that should succeed um, in those instances where there is not enough space. Um, I do want to point out um, since the last update, um, one of the most significant, I, I, I think, things it, to assist the litigators um, in this area is the filing of the statement of interest by the U.S. Department of, Ju of Justice in the case of Boise v. Bell. Um, in that case, the United States Department of Justice argued that making it a crime for people who are homeless to sleep in public places when there is insufficient shelter space in a city unconstitutionally punish them, punishes them for being homeless. Um, and as you heard, I just said, the courts are, are willing uh, to accept that argument. Um, the DOJ went on to say it should, actually, it should be uncontroversial that punishing conduct that is a universal and unavoidable consequence of being human violates the amendment. Sleeping is a life-sustaining activity. It must occur at some time and in some place. If a person literally has nowhere else to go, enforcement of an anti-camping ordinance 
against that person, criminalizes her for being homeless. Um, so as a matter of advocacy, the advocates, of course, should be aware of that statement of interest and um, should employ it when it can be employed. Um, what we saw in the area of camping and sweeps, um, the success of litigation was apparent in a, lot, in a bunch of recent cases that achieved settlements um, soon after litigation was filed. Um, in a couple of those cases, um, some of which regarded um, as part of the case, the seizure of people's property. Um, again, as I said, in many instances, um, these seizures happen without notice, um, without, without um, the county taking care to account for the property, to store it somewhere, to let someone know that they may be able to retrieve the property. So in, in a couple of cases, um, we saw counties or cities or states um, agreeing to fix their policies to ensure that these unconstitutional violations uh, don't, don't, don't happen. Um, those settlements were achieved in Hawaii in late 2016, in the case of Martin v. Um, City of Honolulu, and also in California in the case of Allen v. Pomona. Um, in both of those settlements, there were um, an agreement to uh, put procedures into place to account for the property of the homeless, um, including things as public notice in advance of the sweeps, um, a time in advance to remove items so that it will not be subject to a sweep, um, requirements that the city or town store the property for a sufficient amount of time and implement a procedure and notice to allow people to uh, retrie retrieve uh, their property. Um, we also saw the Eighth Amendment um, argument succeed in a case of Cobine versus the city of Eureka. Um, in that case, plaintiffs um, successfully demonstrated that there was insufficient shelter space to accommodate the homeless uh, population. And at oral argument on the temporary restraining order in that case, the city represented that it could and would guarantee shelter for plaintiffs. So the litigation didn't proceed, but it achieved the exact result that um, it was filed for. We've also seen success with claims under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment um, relating to, again, search and seizure, search and seizure, or the targeting of encampments. Um, th these are based on um, unreasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Those cases are very appropriate for cases criminalizing homeless through the sweeps, as our 14th Amendment due process claims. Um, in the case of Smith v. Corvallis, an Oregon case, a court refused to dismiss a case in which plaintiffs argued that the city routinely confiscated and disposed of their property without adequate notice in violation of the Fourth Amendment prohibition on unreasonable search and seizure and the 14th Amendment due process claims. So. Um, as you heard, um, with the help of the manual, probably, and, and the law center was, was part of a lot of these cases, um, these, these theories are succeeding. Uh, but I would conclude by noting that um, a lot of advocacy is still needed um, in our review of the cases. Not surprisingly, many of these cases are dismissed for lack of insufficient um, facts, inability to, to get affidavits from plaintiffs and, or plaintiffs disappearing, um, and also just not pursuing um, um, stating the, all of the necessary elements of the claims. Um, these obviously are real important litigations and people undertaking them should um, you know, be careful to not create bad law. Um, because there are many compelling cases that could be brought, and there's just a lot of room for for advocacy and for pressing the issues with novel advocacy. So with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, David. Thank you very much, Dan. And um, just on behalf of Shepard Mullen, just want to echo Dan's comments. Uh, it's, it's really been wonderful uh, to work with, with the Law Center on this project, uh, obviously very uh, novel, cutting-edge uh, issues that are at the at the forefront um, of what is, you know, continues to be a, a struggle um, for the most vulnerable of our society to to basically just, you know, not be 
harass, not have their property confiscated to, you know, do the best that they can without having to have their constitutional rights, uh, you know, not respected by by law enforcement and and the cities in which they live. So um, my piece of it uh, basically concerns uh, what over the last two years has been a very very positive development uh, in the context of First Amendment challenges to what is mostly local ordinances banning uh, panhandling, solicitation, even activities as seemingly benign as somebody standing uh, in you know in the middle of a in the middle of a road, kind of in the median. You know, I'm sure, we've all seen this before, where you get on an off ramp and there's uh, sometimes somebody there who you know unfortunately is is soliciting money or, or food and uh, even even laws have, have sprung up that try to criminalize that activity or subject uh, those types of people to, to civil penalties so uh, basically just to, to back up really the, the the watershed moment in this positive trend uh, stems from a Supreme Court case that was issued in June of 2015 which is Reed v town of, of Gilbert uh, Arizona uh, of course, this was alluded to uh, uh, by Tristia in her in her presentation, and you know basically this was a this was a case where uh, you know a local ordinance in in Arizona had had put restrictions on basically ideological signs, uh, political signs, uh, even uh, temporary, basically only allowing temporary directional signs, uh, and the court basically analyzed uh, those under strict scrutiny and and held that. Uh, those types of, of signs were content-based, uh, not merely uh, restrictions on subject matter, which would have been subject to a, to a lesser standard uh, of review. So, you know, in, in Gilbert, the court ultimately held that, uh, that those types of restrictions uh, were content-based, uh, subject to strict scrutiny, and did not pass uh, strict scrutiny. So, you know, basically, uh, since that time, uh, the, the track record for, uh, for cases challenging uh, anti-panhandling, anti-solicitation ordinances, of course, you know, different uh, in, in kind from, from restrictions on signs, uh, you know, insofar as it's, it's talking about people's behavior as opposed to signs that are being posted in communities. Uh, you know, based on our, on our research, uh, you know, the plaintiffs have been batting a thousand uh, in these cases, which is obviously encouraging going forward. So, you know, just a couple of the cases uh, that I want to talk about, uh, kind of representative examples of, of success. Uh, you know, I'd like to start out by by discussing uh, a case from from the Middle District of Florida, uh, the Homeless Helping Homeless Inc. v. City of Tampa, uh, 2016 Westlaw 4162882, and this is a, a a ruling from August of last year, 2016. And basically, in the homeless helping homeless case, this of course is a you know classic situation where you have an advocacy organization uh, that that sued, of course, on behalf of its members, uh, had standing, and you know basically, you know their their mission was devoted to uh, you know, charitable 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 means, and uh, they would offer emergency shelter to the homeless, and would basically you know have people go out and, and solicit donations. Um, to fulfill its mission. Um, as they noted in the opinion, homeless helping homeless relies on staff and volunteers to pr pursue private money. And the opinion noted that they had raised uh, more than $26,000 from 2011 to 2013 just by focusing on downtown Tampa uh, and soliciting donations. So basically in, in, in 2013, the Tampa City Council enacted an ordinance that uh, effectively shut this type of activity down um, and made it impossible for uh, homeless helping homeless to to do the same kind of activity, i.e. solicit donations without running afoul of, of this local ordinance. So, you know, basically to go back to to the Reed v. Gilbert opinion, uh, probably the most significant part of that opinion, you know, is, is where they, they rule that um, you know, a law is content-based on its face and subject to strict scrutiny, regardless of the government's benign motive, any content-neutral justification, or lack of animus toward the ideas contained in the regulated speech. Uh, it basically uh, states that, 
you know, any, any kind of expressive activity that is prohibited by an ordinance is presumptively con unconstitutional. And for any uh, you know, local or state ordinance to pass uh, First Amendment scrutiny, it has to survive strict scrutiny. And of course, as we all know, that's a very, a very difficult, uh, difficult test to satisfy. So, you know, basically just on, on strict application of, of the Reed uh, v. Gilbert opinion, the judge in the homeless helping homeless case uh, struck down the, the Tampa ordinance, um, granted their motion for judgment on the pleadings, and uh, ordered the, the court to enter judgment in favor of homeless helping homeless, declaring the ordinance unconstitutional for infringing on the rights of free speech under the First Amendment, and permanently enjoining the city uh, from enforcing the ordinance going forward. So obviously a, a fantastic outcome uh, in that case, uh, and you know, a, a very solid example of the way the, the wind is blowing as far as these cases are concerned. Uh, we've also seen uh, in, in state courts, uh, Trista alluded to a recent case from the Supreme Court of, of Washington State. This was a, an en banc opinion that was issued in July of last year, uh, and, and fairly similar facts. Uh, this regarded a, an ordinance that prohibited uh, any type of begging or solicitation on freeway ramps or at uh, major intersections uh, in the city of Lakewood, Washington. Uh, and, and basically, you know, this was actually a, a criminal case because, uh, you know, one of the, the litigants, Robert Willis, was a homeless resident who was convicted uh, of violating this municipal ordinance, um, which prohibited begging and any asking for money or goods as a charity, whether by words, bodily gestures, signs, or other means uh, at on and off ramps leading to and from state intersections from any city roadway or overpass. Mr. Willis was issued a criminal citation for begging, which of course seems extremely harsh, uh, after a police officer saw him walk into the traffic lanes at an exit ramp off Interstate 5. Um, and as often, often happens after you know, what would seem to be a, a rather routine interaction with the police, uh, you know, he took action, got, got retained counsel, and you know, challenged this ordinance on, on, First, Amendment, on First Amendment grounds. Uh, also alleged it was unconstitutionally vague under the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause uh, and violated the, the Equal Protection Clause by essentially criminalizing poverty. Uh, and initially, the, the Court of Appeals in Washington affirmed the conviction, uh, but the Washington Supreme Court accepted uh, Mr. Willis's petition for review. And before the Washington Supreme Court, uh, they vacated the conviction and identified several errors with the lower appellate court's analysis. Uh, first, the Supreme Court uh, held that the Superior Court and the Court of Appeals uh, rejected Willis's First Amendment challenge because they concluded that governments may restrict speech in a freeway ramp. Uh, in other words, because the trial record contained evidence that Willis had entered the lane of vehicle travel in the ramp, the courts had concluded that his speech occurred in a non-public forum and his constitutional challenges uh, had to fail. Um, but in doing so, the Supreme Court noted the lower courts essentially rewrote the ordinance uh, so that it prohibited free, prohibited speech in free, free ramps instead of at both ramps and intersections. So, uh, I mean, a little, uh, you know, artful statutory construction there. Um, but, but basically, the, the takeaway was that the Supreme Court held that the lower courts had erred in rejecting Willis's spatial First Amendment challenge um, as his actual conduct was irrelevant as to whether the ordinance uh, was constitutional, because again, in, in a facial challenge, you're, you know, it, it's not as applied. You're, you're looking at uh, the constitutionality of the statute without having to take into account the, uh, the alleged conduct at issue. And, you know, again, you know, we see the power of, of the Reed decision, because later on in the opinion, uh, the, the Washington Supreme Court basically stated, if there was any doubt about this when the city enacted the begging ordinance, that doubt has been definitively resolved by the Supreme Court's recent decision in Reed. Uh, and of course, this is significant that the, the Supreme Court latched on to, to the Reed decision because uh, the, the Willis case was a, was a criminal case, not a, not a civil case um, like in the, in the Reed v. Gilbert situation. So, you know, again, another example of, uh, of a court post-Reed applying the same kind of fact, the same kind of factual reasoning and rationale 
uh, to a criminal case, and, and ultimately, you know, again, in, in this case, there was a there was a, a successful outcome uh, because the Supreme Court ultimately ruled that Mr. Willis's facial challenge to the anti-begging ordinance uh, succeeded. Uh, moving on, uh, another recent case actually from the from Springfield, Illinois, uh, and, and this is a case with a rather long procedural history. This is Norton v. City of Springfield, uh, 806 uh, Federal Reporter 3rd, 411 from the Seventh Circuit, uh, and this decision came out just two months after, after Reed, so we're talking August of 2015, uh, and, and just to, to get back to the procedural history of this, uh, this was a decision that was written by Judge Easterbrook uh, of the Seventh Circuit, and uh, initially, um, uh, the, the plaintiffs had challenged the city of Springfield's anti-panhandling ordinance, and uh, earlier in the litigation, the district court had concluded that, uh, that the ordinance did pass First Amendment scrutiny, and on the initial appeal, the Seventh Circuit agreed and concluded that Springfield's uh, anti-panhandling ordinance did not draw lines based on the content uh, of anyone's speech. Uh, now, after, shortly after that decision came out, the, the plaintiffs asked the Seventh Circuit uh, to basically conduct a petition for rehearing, uh, and they deferred in consideration of that petition pending the outcome in Reed uh, and requested supplemental briefing from the parties. And uh, you know, when it went back up to the Seventh Circuit the second time, uh, they decided, you know, again, the power of Reed, that Reed controlled and that the panhandling ordinance or anti-panhandling ordinance was was unconstitutional. Uh, as the as Judge Easterbrook wrote, he said Reed understands content discrimination differently. It wrote that regulation of speech is content-based if a law applies to particular speech because of the topic discussed or the idea or message expressed. Further, Springfield's ordinance regulates because of the topic discussed and analogize this case uh, to what happened in the town of Gilbert case uh, where the, the, the city in Arizona had justified its sign ordinance in part by contending as the city of Springfield also did that the ordinance was neutral with respect to ideas and viewpoints. Uh, however, after Reed, uh, the Supreme Court and ultimately the Seventh Circuit stated that that type of reasoning uh, was not sufficient. Uh, and, and basically, Judge Easterbrook goes on to note that the majority opinion in Reed effectively abolishes any distinction between content regulation and subject matter regulation, uh, there, because any law distinguishing one type of speech from another by reference to its meaning now references a compelling justification. So you can probably see where this is going. Uh, if you have an ordinance that prohibits people from soliciting money, soliciting donations, of course, whether they're they're homeless or not. I mean, one of the you know underlying uh, assumptions in these cases is that often these these suits are tried to are are, are brought against uh, the most vulnerable, least fortunate people who are just trying to get by. Uh, and you know, here comes the First Amendment to basically save the day in these types of cases and protect uh, protect homeless individuals and you know other people who are doing what amounts to very rather benign activity. Uh, to make sure that their constitutional rights aren't trampled upon. Uh, there was also a concurring opinion in the Norton case from Judge Mannion, uh, who just who agreed with the court's ruling but wanted to write separately, uh, just to underscore what he called the significance of the of the Supreme Court's decision in Reed, um, and again agreed with Easterbrook that the Supreme Court uh, once and for all had had really clarified any ambiguity as to what con constituted a content-based uh, regulation of speech. So uh, again, I think the main takeaway going forward from, from these cases uh, you know, is, is just to realize that, that now if you have any kind of anti-panhandling, anti-solicitation ordinance on the books, there's a extremely strong, strong chance, if not uh, getting to the point of saying it is now virtually well-established that those types of laws are not going to pass First Amendment scrutiny because those laws are you know, regulating speech based on either a topic that is being discussed or a message that is being expressed. Uh, you know, as an overarching comment, the, the, the US Supreme Court in the last 10 years under Justice, Chief Justice Roberts has been very protective of, of First Amendment rights. And this is just, this is just 
one of the latest uh, installments uh, in, in a line of cases that, you know, is, is really going to look closely at any kind of uh, restriction that tries to uh, place civil or criminal penalties uh, on the ability of anybody, uh, of course, including the homeless, to, to, to basically uh, solicit uh, donations, charitable organizations from soliciting donations. So uh, I think that's a very positive uh, envelop development, obviously, uh, for, for the mission of the Law Center and you know, also to protect uh, protect people going forward. So uh, there are some additional cases that, that we do talk about uh, in, in the manual as well. Um, uh, I don't have time to get into all of them, but uh, kind of a, a similar uh, a similar outcome occurred in uh, in another case that's from the First Circuit in Massachusetts, Fayer v. City of Worcester, where, uh, again, similar situation. You had an ordinance that made it unlawful for people to beg and panhandle. Um, and that ultimately uh, turned around, and we had a, a positive outcome after after the read decision. So, um, don't want to over overdo it on my time. So, uh, I'll just leave it at that uh, for now, and happy to take any questions uh, going forward. Thanks so much, David and Dan, for uh, for your uh, work on the manual and for presenting today. Um, we're gonna uh, uh, leave some time for questions at the end, um, but I do want to move on to the next section of our uh, webinar today, uh, sharing of items between um, the, the campaign members. Um, so quickly, uh, just to um, uh, see how people were um, uh, benefiting from uh, the presentation earlier, uh, Janelle, do you want to launch a couple of quick poll questions for us? Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. This is Janelle Fernandez at the Law Center. So you should have a survey poll on your screen right now, and you can answer that for us just by clicking directly into the window. We would really love to know, um, as a result of this webinar so far, do you have a better understanding of criminalization litigation? Um, your options are yes, a lot, yes, a little, or no, not really. Um, so just go ahead and click right into that question box they are on your screen to let us know how informative this has been for you so far. It's really helpful information for us in helping us craft um, useful trainings and webinars and presentations for the future. So looks like most folks have voted. So I'll leave it up for just another second. Okay, so let me share those survey results with you. So a vast majority of you found this um, quite helpful, it looks like, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. And now I will launch our second and last poll question, which is, uh, will you use the information that you learned today in your work or advocacy going forward? Um, so if you could just click right in there to let us know, you know, yes, no, or if that's not applicable to your work or advocacy, that would be great. Um, and again, you can just click right into the box, and this helps us um, know how effective these trainings are, how they're being used, um, you know, on the ground and in the field. So I will leave this up for just a few more seconds. Most folks have voted. All right, and let me share these results with you. Again, by and large, most folks are going to be using this information in your work, which is really fantastic. We love to hear that. So thank you so much for uh, voting in those polls, and I will turn it back over to Eric Tars. Great. Thanks, Janelle, um, and thanks to uh, all of uh, you who are uh, participating in the polls. Um, I now wanted to uh, turn things over to our colleagues at the National Coalition for the Homeless, who, um, you know, based on all of this work um, that we were talking about today, obviously uh, it's not just litigation that's going to change the country. And in fact, that's a, a complementary strategy to the work uh, that goes on on the ground in the communities every day. And so um, we want to call on um, Megan and Annie from uh, the National Coalition for the Homeless uh, to talk about their National Day of Action for Housing. Um, so let me, uh, are you guys on? Yeah, Eric, can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, the National Law Center, for allowing me to take some time to talk about our National Day of Action for Housing. 
Um, so after this last election cycle, we realized that only one candidate talked about the affordable housing crisis and homelessness, which really sparked this idea here at the National Coalition that we need to ha have a more national conversation about the affordable housing crisis, homelessness, and the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness. And as a result, we came up with this National Day of Action for Housing. So on April 1st, this Saturday, here in the District of Columbia, we will be holding a rally, a teach-ins, and an overnight vigil at Freedom Plaza uh, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. So please come if you're in the district. Please come and join us and stand in solidarity to address these very important issues. Um, we understand that many people are not going to be able to attend D.C. or be in D.C. to attend. So we've encouraged groups across the country to hold their local actions and address the issues that they're facing in their own communities. And right now we have over 20 um, organizations and groups who have registered their events. Um, and these events are in various different forms from media blitzes to actually holding an encampment in front of local state um, uh, state houses as well. And all that information can be found on our website, which Eric has posted. Um, and so please come out, stand in solidarity with us, help us stimulate the conversation around affordable housing crisis, homelessness, and the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness. And if you aren't able to attend or host your own event, there's still an opportunity for you guys to get involved by endorsing this action. We are hoping this will be a springboard to start um, and stimulate the conversation on a national level, but also on a local level as well. So please check out our website, and here's also some policy asks as well. There's a lot more information on the website, but I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I really appreciate all of you guys' hard work, but um, we really need to start addressing the affordable housing crisis, homelessness, and the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness, because this is not a joke, and with the new, proposed federal budget cuts, we're going to see a lot more people hopefully not uh, experiencing homelessness. So thank you, Eric, and thank you for the Law Center for allowing me to talk about this National Day of Action. Absolutely. Thank you, Annie and NCH, for your, your partnership on the campaign and for uh, organizing, as you said, over 20, um, 20 organizations and communities uh, participating in this event all across the country. Um, it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, so now uh, we're going to hear from some other folks uh, who have signed up in advance uh, to talk about um, uh, what's going on in their communities, um, but uh, we also would welcome uh, additional people participating. Um, you can uh, raise your hand uh, by clicking on the little hand raise button or um, submit your questions or uh, just uh, any updates you want to share into the, the chat box on the side. Um, but now I'd like to move on, um, uh, and first we'll call on Peter Sabian, uh, working with the Rhode Island Homeless Bill of Rights Group. Uh, Peter, are you there? Yes, hi. Can everyone hear me? Yep, go right ahead. Okay, so uh, here in Rhode Island, uh, the city of Cranston had just passed their uh, anti-panhandling ordinance, I believe, in uh, February. Uh, it's a, aimed at um, panhandlers and uh, the homeless people. What it does is it criminalizes uh, standing on uh, certain uh, islands, on, uh, on certain streets, uh, mostly the, the busiest intersections in, in Cranston. And uh, we have just challenged this law on Monday, yesterday. We had about uh, 30 activists and volunteers show up at one of the busiest intersections in Cranston and we have received 15 fines. Um, both uh, the fines included the violations of this new law as well as the state law that uh, prohibits uh, crossing a freeway, even though the intersection didn't have any freeways there. So we're gonna be fighting all of those ordinances now. We're gonna turn them over to ACLU and we're gonna challenge this law, uh, which is uh, narrowly tailored, allegedly, um, pursuant to the uh, one that's been uh, struck down a couple of years ago in Cranston, uh, because Cranston tried to, to do a similar thing a couple of years ago. So now Mayor Alan Fung is, um, you know, his, his agenda is he's trying to um, protect the people and, you know, uh, it's a public safety bill, that's what he's saying, but we're gonna challenge him on that. 
Now, after Cranston passed it, uh, the city of Warwick uh, decided to pass, pass a similar bill, and they were going to hold hearings on it, and they did. They held their first hearing, and a lot of our folks showed up as well. So uh, the city of Warwick is now going to um, put this off for a while. They want to find out what's going to happen in Cranston after ACLU files their lawsuit. So that's uh, good news. We also had hearings at the Providence, um, at Rhode Island State House a couple of weeks ago. We had a Democratic and a Republican bill that aimed to criminalize uh, panhandling as well, statewide, that is. Um, it, the two bills said that the operator or passengers or any of any motor vehicles could not stop on any public highway to give anything to anyone standing nearby. And the first violation was, was going to be punishable by $75, then $150, and then $300 for a third uh, violation. So we had a pretty good hearing. Uh, we had a lot of people show up and argue against it. Uh, so we don't think that those committees are going to go anywhere. Uh, as of now, they're marked for further, held for further study. Uh, chances are um, they're not going to pass. They're not going to make it out of the committee. So these are just some of the things that have been going on in Rhode Island uh, since uh, <laughs> since uh, many years now, but uh, since January primarily. Thanks so much, Peter. That's uh, that's great, and uh, it's great to see um, the the coordination between the organizers and the litigators. Um, really emphasizing that uh, you know uh, we are all part of uh, uh, different parts of, of the same struggle um, here. So. Uh, and congratulations. Um, I, I saw uh, there was a lot of really fantastic media coverage of the organizing and the action uh, that you guys did in Cranston. So um, congrats on, on that. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Naomi Smoot from the Coalition for Juvenile Justice. Naomi, are you there? I am. Thanks so much for having us on the phone today. Um, on February 28th, we at CJJ released um, through the help of Lisa Pilnick, um, our new principles on the intersections between homelessness and juvenile justice, youth homelessness and juvenile justice. Um, and this is really a comprehensive tool that communities can use. It details um, a variety of ways that communities can work together through schools, um, judges, lawmakers, so that we can all hopefully um, turn the tide and make sure that young people don't either become homeless because of juvenile justice involvement, um, and that similarly, they don't become justice involved because they're experiencing homelessness. And that is available on our website at juvejustice.org backslash homelessness. Great, and I think um, uh, we can share that um, link uh, with folks after uh, Afterwards, uh, everybody should get a link to that. Um, thanks, Naomi. Uh, and moving on to uh, Naomi's colleague, Lisa, um, who's now working as a consultant with the ABA Homeless Youth Legal Network. Sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, so yes, I am here today to talk to you guys about the American Bar Association's Homeless Youth Legal Network, although um, I did work very closely uh, with Naomi and 4CJJ on the principles, so if there are questions on either of those, I'm happy to answer um, either of those questions once we get to the question and answer period. So the American Bar Association has created a um, Homeless Youth Legal Network and the idea behind that is to try to increase legal services for youth and young adults who are experiencing or at risk for homelessness. The network will provide information and foster collaboration in order to help attorneys and other advocates access, um, address existing gaps in legal services and improve outcomes for homeless youth and young adults um, with a special focus on those transitioning from child welfare and exiting the juvenile justice system, but really any young person who is at high risk for or experiencing homelessness. So in terms of the work right now and going forward, um, first of all, we're really excited to continue collaborating with our partners at the Law Center and its Project LEARN, as well as uh, many of uh, the others of you who are members of the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign. And our current sort of ask for you in the one minute that we have today is um, that we're trying to connect with attorneys, organizations, um, and other professionals who want to participate in the network. And that includes uh, people who are doing direct legal representation of young people, as well as those who are doing systemic or policy work. So really everyone um, on this call, you know, if you're touching youth at all in your work, um, 
you really should, I would encourage you to become part of this network. Um, and that really includes, again, policy work, impact litigation, civil legal work, juvenile and criminal defense, and um, that includes both minors and young adults through at least age 25. So um, the best way to connect with us right now is to start by taking our survey. And I believe that everyone got the link to the survey in the chat box. Um, that survey will kind of ask you what the legal needs you're seeing are, what you're doing currently in terms of policy or uh, rep direct representation. And also it'll let you check a box if you want to join our listserv. Um, and so that way you can sort of keep uh, informed on, on other things as well. If for some reason you don't want to take the survey but want to be on the listserv, um, you can email hyln at americanbar.org um, or you can email me directly and I can uh, add you to the listserv as well. And again, I'm happy to take any questions about that um, or uh, anything else as we get into the question and answer period. And uh, thanks again to the Law Center for letting us uh, share this information. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and uh, if you can send all that uh, summarized, um, we can get that out to, to all the participants um, in the, the webinar today. Um, and just to, to follow up, um, you mentioned our Project Learn Network, which uh, is Another uh, legal network we've developed uh, on litigators and other advocates who are working um, specifically on homeless students' access to education, but also including um, due process rights of homeless students in school who may be caught up in disciplinary issues. Um, if you're interested in joining that, uh, you can contact us at the, the Law Center. And that, that network is in turn part of the, the broader ABA uh, network and um, we're cross-fertilizing, um, so happy to, uh, to continue to do that. Um, next, uh, I will turn it over to Nicole and Jeff from uh, New York City. Nicole and Jeff? Yes, yeah, so it's just Nicole today. Um, Jeff is, has a day off, so we're going to let him have that day off. But um, um, yeah, so in New York City, we formed a steering committee, and um, we had an event in the mid-November to um, on the steps of City Hall that Eric, we were lucky to have Eric attend. And since then, we've really been working on three things. So um, we modified the national survey a bit to incorporate a few local New York City questions um, regarding right to counsel, source of income discrimination, and um, a bill in City Council about listing city-owned vacant properties for um, potential afford affordable housing development. Um, very happy that one of those questions about the um, right to counsel is not applicable anymore because of the city announcing um, an agreement to start a civil legal services program and housing court. But so anyway, we've um, been we've been um, distributing those questionnaires amongst our clients, and um, we're going to be returning a bunch to Megan this week, and we're going to continue to distribute amongst our clients. So we can get more concrete, you know, examples of, of how criminalization is going on in communities across New York City. Um, the second thing we're working on is we're trying to get the New York City Continuum of Care to formally address the um, Continuum of Care NOFA anti-criminalization component. Um, as people probably know, HUD awards two points to continuums that implement specific strategies to prevent homeless criminalization. Two points doesn't sound like a lot, but um, in New York City, that could be, be about $11 million. And um, we really have a goal for New York City to really delineate specific strategies to ensure that homelessness is not criminalized. Um, so in the short term, we want to present to our New York City continuum of care on why this is important. And specifically that besides the issues of, you know, because it's important to the criminalization, it's important, uh, I mean, also to the continuum because it's cost effective. If they can, they start doing things that are specific, they may be able to get these two points. Um, also, um, long term, we hope to get the city to identify and adopt specific anti-criminalization strategies. So, for example, um, something along the lines of Broward County in Florida, where the Broward County Continuum of Care Board voted to formally request the county to adopt a position to not criminalize homelessness. We'd like to get a similar resolution in New York City. That's the ultimate goal there. Um, also, we'd like to get a meeting. We have a relatively new New York 
City Police De- Police Department Commissioner, uh, Commissioner O'Neill. We'd like to get a meeting with him about homeless criminalization and present him with a list of five demands. Um, demands, we've been working on what those demands would encompass, and we've come up with a couple of um, ideas in terms of addressing homeless encampment sweeps, particularly giving individuals who are experiencing homelessness notice, and also um, their ability to um, seize their property. Some of that litigation we discussed earlier was very helpful with regards to that. I know there was a poll question on if we found it helpful, and yes, we did very much. Um, we didn't utilize that in our advocacy search strategies here in New York City. Um, and also, we're interested in talking with the commissioner about clearing um, the statutory warrant of, person, of a person experiencing homelessness. Um, what the city's previously done, they do so to a lesser extent now, is go into homeless shelters and do raids and uh, people, uh, people with uh, backgrounds. Well, we want them, and, but there's been some good movement in terms of the borough president in Brooklyn and others doing days where you can get your background um, cleaned up, and we want to do that, to, to do work with people instead of penalizing them for their backgrounds. Um, I think if, people are, if people on the call are from, uh, from New York, they're interested in participating, you could contact um, Eric, and he could let myself or Jeff know, also Rob Robinson, um, also, I think a couple of the challenges that we have, New York City homelessness is, for the past three years, been very active, very hot topic, good and bad. We have a mayor who's very active, and um, he, last week, we can have to go introduce a new plan regarding closing certain shelters and opening others. It's a lot of going on with regards to homelessness, therefore terms of plans and so I think besides what's going on at the federal level, besides what's going on the budgets, you have a lot going on at the city level in terms of homelessness policy that we're constantly reacting to. And I think in an advocacy sense that makes it hard to work on this campaign because while it intera- intersects with homelessness, um, there's also these immediate priorities that, you know, our electeds have, that our council members have, is there a shelter in their district, et cetera. So I think that's one of the things, um, you know, we're, we're working with. And also, I think when we like to grow our steering committee. So if people are interested, that would be great. Again, you could contact Eric. Um, or if any of you know Rob Robinson, you can contact him. Um, but we're definitely looking to grow. And um, I want to thank, also thank Eric for the opportunity to speak on, you know, what we've been looking at. Great. Thanks for, for sharing. Um, sure. And it's really exciting work that you guys are doing. Um, and I, I hope that we are able to, to get some more people participating in your group. Um, yes, we hope so, too. <laughs> uh, so next, uh, turning over to Hillary and Allie from the Yale Law School International Human Rights Clinic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you um, for including us in this. We've learned a lot. We really appreciate um, everyone. Uh, uh, who's participated so far. Um, just really quickly, we'll keep this brief. Uh, in November, we released a report called Forced into Breaking the Law, and it documents uh, the ways in which homelessness is criminalized here in Connecticut um, and how these laws violate both U.S. and international law. Um, and currently, we are doing advocacy across the state and uh, specifically in New Haven to hopefully stop the enforcement of the laws that criminalize homelessness here. Um, and we're hoping to work with the Board of Alders to pass a resolution or a local homeless person's Bill of Rights um, that acknowledges this issue. And this is Allie here, and also thank you to Eric and the Law Center um, and the campaign for helping us as we were conceiving of our report. Um, as a follow-up, we're also working on a short white paper that's going to analyze diversionary courts as an alternative to criminalizing homelessness. Uh, we visited court programs in Los Angeles and Seattle, and we're now working on um, assessing the benefits and pitfalls of these programs specifically for people experiencing homelessness from a human rights perspective. So that will be forthcoming this spring. Um, and if anyone is interested in collaborating uh, in Connecticut or elsewhere or wants more information about our report, uh, please reach out to forcedintobreakingthelaw at gmail.com, all one word. Um, and the link to our report is on this slide here. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. And um, uh, for folks who are wondering more about how to apply international human rights standards, 
um, in domestic cases, uh, this report has, is a fantastic um, example of how to do that. Um, so moving on, I, uh, John Pollock, are you there? John said he might not be able to make it. Um, in which case I will, uh, he sent a couple of bullets uh, for me to share. Um, he said that, uh, that there's been a number of uh, updates, uh, big happenings uh, regarding the right to counsel in housing cases um, in New York City. Uh, Mayor de Blasio announced the city will be providing a right to counsel for all tenants below 200% of the poverty level, and we'll be increasing the city's investment in eviction defense by $93 million in order to effectuate it. Um, it's going to be phased in over five years, although the details haven't been all worked out yet. Um, and uh, just noting that after the city's prior $60 million investment um, over the course of the past two years, eviction, eviction representation rates rose from 1% to 27%, and the rate of evictions dropped during the same period by 24%. So that is a huge contribution um, to preventing homelessness, preventing people from being on the streets in the first place uh, so that they never need to be put into handcuffs. So that's a, that's a huge victory and hopefully a model that can be replicated across the country. Right now, uh, Massachusetts as a, as a state has introduced a, a right to counsel bill uh, for housing um, uh, through the efforts of Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, um, and it's explicitly labeled as a homelessness prevention bill and would similarly guarantee counsel to those below 200% of the poverty level, those eligible for public benefits or those who couldn't pay for counsel without being deprived of the necessities of life. Um, the bill is supported by a prior study finding that fewer than 6% of tenants are represented and that every dollar spent on eviction defense saves $2.69 on other state services. Um, D.C. also introduced last year and again this year uh, an expanding Access to Justice Act that would expand housing representation with an eye on moving towards the right to counsel. Um, it would utilize full scope representation but also uh, provide limited scope and brief legal services as uh, additional strategies. Uh, the Philadelphia City Council passed an ordinance ordering hearings on the impact of evictions and whether a right to counsel is a solution. Um, the first hearing was uh, just last week on March 20th, um, and prior research here had found that only 8% of tenants are represented, and representation greatly increases chances of avoiding eviction. Um, last but not least, the California Shriver Act, passed in 2009, authorized a six-year pilot uh, study in which nine sites, many of which uh, 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 focus on evictions, um, uh, were uh, funded to do right to counsel work. In 2016, um, the six year sunset on the law was removed, making the pilots permanent, and the first representation on the effects of the representation will be coming out uh, this year. So, all very good news on the right to counsel, but you know, also just in a few places across the country, there's much, much more work to be done there. Um, another person who was uh, not sure if she'd be able to make it, Elaine, are you there? All right, Elaine from the National Low Income Housing Coalition had a couple of updates. Uh, very briefly, um, they are working on their United for Homes campaign, um, which you can find online at nlihc.org slash United for Homes. Um, and uh, that is working on a broad campaign of increasing investment um, for the National Housing Trust Fund uh, and reforming the mortgage interest income tax deduction in order to do so. Um, it's a really fantastic campaign supported by thousands of organizations across the country. Um, and parts of it, uh, even in this Congress, may have a real chance of passing if uh, Congress does turn to tax reform. Um, so uh, important to support if you can. Um, there are also a large number of sign-on letters and dear colleague letters that are circulating in Congress. Um, folks can check out uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition's website um, or unitedforhomes.org for more information on those. Um, lots of ways to get involved at the, the federal level there. Um, and the last uh, person who sent in updates uh, is Kirsten Anderson uh, from Southern Legal Council who uh, sent some updates noting that after uh, using some of the precedent that was talked about earlier 
in the webinar on the panhandling cases. Um, they sent a demand letter to the city of Gainesville uh, demanding ceasing uh, enforcement of their panhandling ordinance, and the city actually did comply. Um, so that's, uh, that's fantastic news. Um, uh, they are also working on an appeal on behalf of Fort Lauderdale's Food Not Bombs, challenging Fort Lauderdale's food sharing ordinance uh, before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, that's still in the middle of briefing and, and the appeal is ongoing. Um, so uh, stay tuned on that one. And similarly in Tampa, uh, they, the city of Tampa is amending its food sharing ban after members of Tampa Food Not Bombs were arrested earlier this year. And those prosecutions of those individuals were dropped by the state attorney who uh, said he wasn't going to prosecute them. Um, so those are updates from people who, uh, who sent in uh, notes earlier. Um, if there's anybody else who uh, wants to uh, contribute something, you can raise your hand now using the raise hand function. Uh, we only have a few minutes left scheduled. Um, so uh, we'd ask folks to be very brief. Um, so not seeing anybody's hands being raised. Um, we do have uh, a couple of questions that have been typed in. Um, I'm afraid we're not gonna have time to get to all of them, but um, just quickly, some folks asked, uh, will the, uh, the webinar be recorded? Yes, the whole webinar is being recorded, and if uh, technology is kind to us, we should be able to post it, and we'll be circulating the link, um, along with uh, the links to all of the underlying materials uh, uh, later this week or early next week. Um, the manual itself is accessible on our website, nlchp.org. Um, and it's uh, you know, right in, on the home page. You can find a link to the manual. Um, and uh, see here, any other quick questions we can get to? Um, looks like many of them are, are a little bit more substantive. Um, oh, we, we do have a, a question. Um, on the, the Menstrual Equity for All Act of 2017, which is an act that was uh, circul um, circulated on the Housing Not Handcuffs Listserv a few weeks ago. Uh, this is an act, a uh, piece of national legislation introduced by Congresswoman Meng of Queens um, and uh, were, uh, would require shelters, um, and it would allow federal dollars to be used to pay for um, menstrual health items for, for women. Uh, in the shelters, um, as well as do a, a many other good and positive things. Um, it's a great compliment to all the work that we are doing, and uh, we certainly uh, encourage support for that. Um, I think the bill is currently looking for co-sponsors, so anybody who's interested in that um, uh, should en encourage their uh, local Congress people to, to co-sponsor that bill, um, and we can circulate more information about that following the webinar. Um, so, uh, with that, um, just want to say once again, if you want uh, to join the Housing Not Handcuffs listserv, um, you can do so by endorsing the campaign at housingnothandcuffs.org. Um, just click on the endorse tab and you'll be able to do that. Um, you can endorse as an individual, even if you can't endorse as an organization, um, and you'll be able to click on some boxes to uh, indicate your interest in litigation, policy advocacy, other things. But uh, we hope to have a very uh, lively discussion on our list, people sharing information about what's going on in their local communities, what's going on at the national level, um, and uh, asking questions about litigation, litigation strategy, um, asking <laughs> for assistance, um, et cetera. So this is uh, all part of the discussion that can happen on the list. It's also a discussion that will be happening at our national forum on the human right to housing, again, June 6th to 7th in D.C. We don't have a registration link for that yet, but hopefully we will soon, and we will certainly get it out to all of you. Um, last but not least, uh, here's the contact information for myself and Tristia. Um, 
our deepest apologies to everybody who uh, did send in substantive questions. Um, we will try to follow up with you individually if, uh, if you want to send us an email again um, after the, the presentation. Uh, we will definitely try to get substantive answers back to you, um, and we welcome additional questions uh, and additional coordination on fighting uh, these harmful ordinances in our communities and instead pushing for more constructive alternatives so that we can end homelessness once and for all. Um, so with that, again, this is the first in our series of uh, hopefully about quarterly webinars. So, uh, well, there will be more tools coming down the road. There will be more uh, conversations, uh, and we encourage um, much more daily conversation uh, on our listserv, so please participate in that. Thanks, everybody, and uh, we look forward to next time.